You are listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Well, happy Monday evening, folks. Monday after Thanksgiving. I hope you had a good long weekend and that you didn't have to work all through it. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to my show, the Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com for the audio and all the places you can listen to the show. And you can go over to my YouTube channel, Mr. Scotty Roberts to join the simulcast in video and join the other intrep heads over on the chat room. So, welcome back to the show after the weekend. Uh, today, I'm going to continue our series, and I hope this is good, interesting material for you. It is for me. And somebody asked me, do I do these shows to teach myself as well as you? And the simple answer to that is yes. Uh, you're getting to experience some of my own study on these things as we go. It's not that I haven't looked at this and studied it and researched it over the years, but this particular series we're doing on Christopaganism, compatibilities between spiritualities, what you believe in your heart versus what you were taught to believe, what were you inculcated into, and what is it that... Uh, maybe it's even something you chose to believe. You chose to be inculcated into a certain way of thinking when it comes to your religion, to your spirituality, to biblical things. Yet, have you considered that the Bible that you learn these things from is incomplete? It was put together by Orthodox bishops under the hard fist of a pope who was also the, the Roman emperor, Constantine. He started this process. It finished off over the next century. And you've got a Bible that's missing at least 65 to 70 Gospels, uh, that's missing many books because a bunch of guys determined that they did not fit their political agenda for the church and therefore could not be God's own breathed word. So there's the question for you. When you look at these things, when you d dissect the facts, what do you believe? And then I have to ask you, why do you believe what you say you believe? What's in your heart? What's your spirituality tell you? So we're going to continue that on tonight. We're going to talk about honoring the voices, amongst other things. We're going to start with that, and I'll tell you what that all means. And uh, other than that, I just want to say, let's give you a quick... It's been a cold day here. Uh, we are now at... It was 9 degrees when I got up this morning. Uh, that's Fahrenheit for those of you in Europe and uh, other places around the world that listen to this show. And I don't know how to convert that over. If I did, I would. You know what? Let's just do that. Let's just look at this right now. Let's go over here and find out what exactly 9 degrees Celsius is to you guys who do the metric system, which I don't. So uh, forgive me, but uh, learning the metric system is way too much like math. And I don't do math. And uh, I think I've shared this with you before as I'm waiting for my program to open up. Um, the last math course I ever took in my whole entire life was ninth grade algebra. Ninth grade, folks. That's, we're talking back 73, 74, right in there somewhere. And uh, the only reason that was my, I don't know how. I coasted all through high school, coasted all through college without ever taking another math course. And so I couldn't tell you uh, exactly why. Uh, but uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius, I got it right here. Let's find out. Right now, if it's 9 degrees here, all of those of you who follow the metric system, it is negative 17.2222 to infinity degrees. So it's basically 70, 17 degrees minus 70, 17 degrees for those of you in Australia, Australia. I don't know. Do you use the metric system? I know uh, Great Britain does uh, over on the other side of the world. So uh, there you go. It's cold this morning, and it's going to stay cold. Nice thing, we're not going to get any more snow. We got about a foot of snow on the ground. Clear, crisp, beautiful 
uh, non-humid, dry, beautiful, crisp blue, clear sky outside. Sun is shining, but it's only 9 degrees. Uh, it's going to go up to a whopping 27 degrees. So that's our day here today. So while it's cold outside here, hopefully it's warm where you are. And this show, for those of you in the great white north, it's going to warm you up a little bit. <laughs> there you go, folks. All right. And since there's nobody to play off of, i got to laugh at my own little bits of humor. So I'm all alone. I'm solo here. So uh, you can uh, you can tell me in the chat room over on the YouTube channel uh, how you're doing today. How you doing? And uh, we'll go from there. I hope everybody's enjoying this. Here we go. Let's launch into it. Um, I'm going to call up my notes over here because I, I've got to use my notes. Today we're going to talk about honoring the voices. What does that mean in spirituality? Let me ask you. In Christianity, did you hear about, learn about honoring the voices? Uh, there's, there's all kinds of scholars out there. They're going to tell you all kinds of things about what you believe and about your religion. And uh, what do you think we should make of the early Christians? Did they just not get it? Um, did God send his son to die uh, and to resurrect and come back offering salvation for all eternity. Did he do that, but really didn't give us any footnotes? We had to kind of figure it out from there. It's kind of like I put that in the same little uh, kettle of stew that's brewing on the back burner where I say there were all these God-men, Messiah types that we in Christianity borrowed or stole a lot of their holidays, their traditions, their, their uh, um, attributes of a Messiah type, a God-man type. And yet God still didn't kind of reshuffle the deck and tell us, well, let's do this differently so nobody gets confused. So why should we be surprised that we don't get a lot of other information? Uh, was their perspective valid in how they believed? And with few exceptions, the Christian denominations today accept the Bible as their official canon of Scripture, the Bible that exists today. You can go over to any bookstore and pick up a Bible. Um, and you can even go to pagan bookstores, metaphysical bookstores, and pick up a Bible. It's considered a spiritual document, and it's a collection of documents. Um, so many people are unaware that there are other books of Scripture that existed and that have survived some of them to the present. And even fewer have read these books. I've read some of them. I've gleaned information from some of them. And sometimes you read information in these apocryphal books, the books that were taken out, the books that were hunted down and destroyed by Orthodox Christianity in the 200s and thereafter. And you can find some of these writings and you'll read it and you'll go, well, that's kind of heretical, isn't it? But remember what your base of knowledge is. Your foundation is what exists in the existing canon of Scripture. That's where you learned Christianity. Of course, things that might look a little differently, that had a little different perspective, are going to seem out of touch or out of sync with what we think we know. And keep in mind, I'm going to state this again, and there are Christian scholars out there that listen to this show, you know that there were at least 65 to 70 other Gospels other than the four that we have. That's just a, a an illustration of how it got pared down to just four Gospels. And only four guys had the right perspective on this. And we say in the church, well, we trust that God has the power to maintain the integrity of his word. Yes, I believed that, and I think that there are a lot of people that believe that. But at the same time, why didn't God have the power to uh, show us something different when all these other God-men rose up? Why did he leave it up to human faith to decide an eternal destiny question? So, with few exceptions, Christianity today is kind of blinded. Uh, they've been taught one particular view. And if you look into the history, as we talked about last week, that one particular view, much of that was based on whether or not the viewpoints expressed in the book 
matched what the church wanted people to believe. What they saw about their own leadership, their own hierarchy within the church, the whole issue of reducing the role of women, eliminating the role of women, uh, took place when they eliminated a lot of these other teachings. So they did this to to uh, honor tradition or culture. They did it to establish their own hierarchy in the church. So these books are not readily available. A lot of people haven't been able to read them. Uh, they were books that were... Um, uh, uh, not allowed to exist anymore. That's how I'm trying to say that. I didn't say that clearly. They were books that were hunted down and, and destroyed. And their followers were also hunted down and destroyed. So, most Christians today accept the Nicene Creed. And uh, uh, many people assume that the doctrine of original sin is foundational to Christianity. When in the beginning, that wasn't always so. The whole notion of original sin was actually replaced, not even replaced. It replaced original goodness in man. If God created something good, could man destroy it by disobedience? Uh, That's the big question. And we talked about the church in China, how they rejected the concept of Jesus as the divine. And many of the early writers in Christianity and many of the early followers of Jesus in the first 200 years after his death didn't even believe in the divinity of Christ. It was not on their plate. It was not in their wheelhouse. And so most Christians today accept the physical resurrection of Jesus as a literal truth. And they may be unaware that many fervent early Christians didn't see the resurrection as literal, but as only a metaphor for a spiritual event. The early Jesus movement, as contained in the Q documents, uh, I won't go through that again, I talked about this in the original documents, uh, collections that came together, appears to have no concept of a resurrection at all. And even Judaism, out of which Christianity springs, uh, did not have a uh, belief in resurrection, bodily resurrection. And many Christians don't realize that part of the reason the literal interpretation of the resurrection was urged by the orthodoxy was to secure its own authority and power, a power that was based on the identity of male persons who witnessed an actual resurrection. So many people today assume that the doctrine of original sin as we started to talk about, is foundational to Christianity. Why would you need a divine Savior if you didn't have original sin? So original sin is foundational to Christianity, but the experience of communities isolated from its development in the West show this not to be the case. Their scriptures show that instead, Christianity can embrace and even coexist with the concept of original sin goodness. Remember when God created man, he created it was good. And all it seemed that man had to do was eat a piece of fruit that made them like the Elohim in Genesis 3, made them like God. And God said, let us go and confound or, or, or prevent them from also eating of the tree of life, lest they become just like us. And so this is uh, um, where that whole concept of original sin sprouts from that. And that, by the way, women, according to the Orthodox Church, women are the cause of this. Adam would never have done that uh, because uh, Adam would have been stronger than Eve. Eve was a woman. and But through the, uh, the woman came the eating of the fruit, and through the eating by the man came the inherited sin nature. Poof! They were all naked and open before God. And of course, that version sidesteps the issue that that's probably an encoded story. That perhaps, if this is all true, and not just allegory, that the forbidden fruit was sexual in nature. Because you look at what happened with Eve. She seduced by the serpent, who wasn't really a snake. We find that he was called Nakosh which was one of the, and we covered this in great detail, uh, in uh, the rise and fall of the Nephilim, 
that uh, Nakosh was one of the Elohim, one of the divine council, one of the cast of gods in the Old Testament, and that he gave fruit after seducing Eve. She took it and she gave it to Adam. And what you have here, not to be crass, but what you have here is kind of a Edenic three-way that happened. And Eve became, I believe, the mother of Adam's son, who was Abel, and also the mother of the serpent's son, Nakosh's son, who was Cain. And you see this division. And from there is the call for the kinsman redeemer, almost immediately, all through the Old Testament. Not to get into that again. But uh, the scriptures show that Christianity can embrace and coexist with the concept of original goodness as opposed to the fall and the original sin nature born and bred into every human being. So, uh, I've covered this material really to raise this question. If Christo-paganism, the blending of Christianity with a different spirituality, such as paganism, is a combination of aspects of paganism and aspects of Christianity, which Christianity would that be that we blend it with? The one that calls God Father or the one that calls God Mother? We went through and we talked about the Mother Goddess, the Shekinah, the Sophia theologies out of uh, ancient uh, Judaism. The one that became a patriarchy? Is that the Christianity we, we, we choose from? Or the one that involved women at the highest levels as well? And if that was a scriptural concept, a godly concept that women not teach in the church, that women stay silent in the church, why do we have women Sunday school teachers for kids, even in churches that believe that? Why do we allow women to sing? Why do we allow them women to uh, testify in church? Why are there some Christian denominations that allow women to be pastors and to speak in churches? The one, uh, uh, so, so the, should we believe in the, the Christianity that uh, excludes women? Should we believe in the one that placed authority within the individual? Or the one that placed it on an ecclesiastical hierarchy? So such as the Roman Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church. Um should we believe that uh, the Christianity we should blend is the one that believes in original sin or the one that believes in original goodness of the heart? Are we making God to be what we want him to be? Maybe this stuff is all true, the way we were taught. Or maybe as we start dissecting the books, we find out that there's a lot of holes there. There's a lot of missing things, and even the early Christians believed differently than we believe now. now I'm not talking about a little group that, that went on for a week and a half after the death of Christ. We're talking about most of Christianity in Western and Eastern cultures for the first 200 years, in China for the first 600 years after the death of Christ. So these have all been valid perspectives within the Christian landscape at one time or another, and they must be all considered a part of Christianity, if only historically, if nothing else. And since pagans frequently feel a kinship or a sense of honoring for peoples whose belief and histories have been lost or silenced, would this not also apply to those voices within Christianity that have been lost and silenced? To include these voices in the Christian landscape changes the landscape. And perhaps Christian experience taken in its totality, is not as opposed to Christopaganism as one might first assume. So, I want to get from there now into talking about mystery religions and Christianity. This is, I think this is important stuff for us to know, guys. So, put on your thinking caps, put on your steel undies, and let's dig into this a little more. we got just a few minutes left in this first segment, but let's start tackling it. Um, there was as an overview of Christianity, which we just talked about for the last few days, um, really reflects this perspective of mainstream scholarship. And even though these scholars debate the issues concerning the early Christian community, the authorship, the dating of writings uh, of Christianity, and which words Jesus might or might not have actually said, they at least agree that their investigations rest on historical truth. 
That is, they believe that Jesus existed as an historical person, as do I, um, as did the other characters in the New Testament, and that the New Testament describes events that occurred in history, in real history. Now, you might not agree with the theology, but the, th the events took place in real history. And for the purposes of the discussion that follows now, uh, we are going to call these scholars the historical group or the historical camp, however you want to look at it. Now, there's a body of research, however, that directly challenges the historicity of Jesus. I've got several books on my shelf that I picked up when I was researching this that challenges whether or not he actually existed as a human being and lived and breathed in first century Judea. And in the 19th century, there's one book I saw that's called Judas of Nazareth, meaning uh, there was no historical evidence for a Jesus, but there's a guy that matches up to a lot of the details of the life of Jesus in first century Judea that came out of Nazareth. Judas. Is it the same guy or is it somebody different? Is it an archetype that was built on? So in the 19th century, only a handful of books were available on this issue. Now, you can buy hundreds of them. Uh, these books were really hard to find and understandably very unpopular among free thinkers. By the 1950s, a few more authors had appeared on this topic and often at the cost of their employment or their clerical office or their scholastic position, academic position in institutions. And this cautious trend continued all the way up through just a few decades ago, the 1970s and 80s. But lately, this body of research has generated significant attention from scholars and philosophers and theologians. Now, is this because we are drawing farther away from God? Or are we pushing farther away from something that we found maybe doesn't tell us the whole story? Um, given the number of books published on this topic in just the recent 20 to 30 years, uh, there's a feeling that it's not going to go away. And so the body of research has raised issues that have never been dealt with in a particularly satisfying manner by Christianity since the first century. And no one from the historical group of scholars that we surveyed addresses the issues raised by the non-historical camp. Now, the non-historical camp is the one that allows many other ways of thinking in. Now, we're unable to really discover any response by a historical scholar in a mainstream publication to the body of non-historical work, which is unsettling at best. And the implications of this material, folks, can be very disturbing. And its impact on the increasingly rational Christian milieu that's now current in the United States seems worthy of a response from the historical camp. And uh, increasingly rational is what I'm looking for. Increasingly rational Christianity. What is that? I'm going to talk about that a little more in the future. But we ourselves found this material disturbing. We, being scholars who will look at this stuff, question it, look at the historical, look at what happened with the early believers in the church, what they actually believed versus what we're told that they believed, and the outcomes that led to orthodox hierarchy in the church. It's disturbing material, as I said even earlier. You start reading this stuff, and you start to step back and say, whoa, wait a minute, what am I actually reading here? So let's call it quits for the first segment. We're already out of time. You guys sit tight. Two minutes. We'll be right back. Hey, gang, welcome back. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to my show, The Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network, ODYSY1.com. Find out all the places you can hear this show on the Internet as well as on terrestrial radio across the nation. And you can also come over to my YouTube channel where I'm simulcasting this broadcast in video. And we have a live chat room there where all the intrep heads like to gather and talk about tonight's show and many other things in the chat room. Sometimes they talk about weird stuff that's way off topic, but that's okay. Come on in and enjoy the family atmosphere there. And that's over at youtube.com slash 
Mr. Scotty Roberts. Now, we left off. We were talking about I wanted to jump right back in and use all this time uh, expeditiously. No, um, just making good use of the time. There we go. Um, I was talking about how disturbing it can be when you start studying some of these things and researching it and finding out that there were other aspects of Christianity you were never taught. So the choice that you're left with is, do I go with Orthodox Christianity, or do I go with this, what I refer to as this increasing rational Christianity? One that looks at the whole picture, not one that just the Catholic hierarchy taught us. And remember, you might say, well, hey, that was the church of the day. But remember, these were also the same Catholic hierarchy that sought out all these books as heresy and blasphemy, destroyed them, and persecuted, and put to death, and tortured the people who believed these things. Is that the hierarchy that you want to follow? Their doctrine of what is wonderful, loving, peaceful, uh, God-breathed salvation, the holiness of God, the Spirit of God living in you and working through you. Do you want a bunch of guys telling you what to do? Or do you want to find out for yourself? And i got to tell you, the big surprise is when you start looking for yourself, you find different answers in what has been delivered. And, of course, when I refer to Orthodox Christianity, I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church for the most part, but almost every denomination that exists today, Protestantism, everything down, are all, what would you say, they, they are all uh, outshoots, off-branches of Orthodox Christianity. So almost everything out there in Christianity today, you got to ask yourself these questions. Now, if you can go into that and look at that and find good answers for that and one that you are willing to accept, then by all means, believe what you know is to be true in your heart. But I'm going to tell you something. God does not seem to go out of his way to enlighten you on what's been written down for 2,000 years. You got people's experiences, anecdotal experiences. You've got interpretations, exegetes. You've got all this stuff that's going on of Scripture. But do you really have the truth in hand to base your spirituality? And I've heard even some pastors tell. I had an old pastor once that I was offering up when I was writing the, the, the book on the Nephilim. And I asked him questions about that. And he said, you know, I said, I said you know, Parson... I called him Parson Larson. I said, uh, um, it seems to me that God is either so much more than we give him credit for in church, or he's so much less. I said, what if he doesn't exist the way we think he does? And he said, Scotty, you know what? He surprised me. He says, you might be right. He says, we teach a, in ministry here, we teach a certain form of the gospel that's right out of the New Testament. He says, that doesn't mean we're right about everything historically. And he says, this is what we teach because it, it works for people's hearts. So there you go. So the implications of all this material can be disturbing for, for us. And that's disturbing all by itself. It says, the Bible itself says, God is not the author of confusion, but of sobriety of mind, a soberness of mind. Um, and, and But does that come when there are all these questions? So this is a fair warning to you that the material that I'm presenting you is not really for the faint of heart. So put on, that's where I said, put on your thinking caps and put on your steel britches uh, because it's going to be some interesting stuff, I think. But uh, some of the sources here are very carefully documented. So I want you to be able to listen to this stuff and deem its credibility as we talk about it. So let's set the stage here. To understand what I'm calling the non-historical body of research regarding Jesus and early Christianity requires a basic knowledge of the world. Now, I'm talking just basics in which Christianity developed. For uh, uh, help with this, I'm going to look at some works of various scholars, and I'll name them, like Charles Gingenbert, who's a professor of Christian history in Paris in the 1920s and the 30s. Um, Gingenbert is actually in the historical camp of Christianity when it comes to Jesus' existence, but he can set the cultural stage for us. 
he noted that all around the Jewish world of Palestine was a pagan milieu. Uh, to the north, to the west, to the southwest, were the Syrians and the Phoenicians, uh, from whom came a mixture of beliefs and worship and, and worship forms. Uh, in the east, Mesopotamia, where influences from India and Persia combined with Babylonian culture. This region was the parent of many ancient myths throughout uh, 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 the Semitic world of the time. This is why, by the way, the Apostle Paul set his eyes on Mesopotamia to go preach the gospel, the Aegean region, because he said they don't know about this stuff up there. All these mystery religions exist up there, which he was familiar with. Uh, to the south was Egypt, where ancient religious practices were universalized under the influence of Greek thought, the Hellenization of the world after um, uh, Alexander the Great. And it was a crossroads of religious thought and practice, Egypt was. And from here flowed Greek myth, philosophical theories, pieces from other religious milieus, uh, including the Jewish where they blended together with a syncretic manner. Um, and uh, Gingenbert, this scholar, notes that as people travel, they take their religious ideas with them. And in this re region, travelers encountered religions whose myths and rituals were similar to their own. It's like I have said many times, if you look at uh, early Mesopotamian religion, we're talking way back now, you had uh, the Anunnaki, cast of gods. You had Elil as the chief god. You had Enki and other minor gods. Well, over the course of a 1,000 to 1,500 years, as people migrated from the Euphrates River Valley down into the Canaanite region, what did they bring with them? They brought those belief systems with them. Elil, the chief god of the Anunnaki, became El, the word for god in the Canaanite culture where Judaism got El for God, E-L, uh, Elohim, El Shaddai, El Elyon, all these names. Enki was also known in the Euphrates River Valley as Ia, the, the letters E-A put together, Ia. And Ia in Canaanite culture over the next 1,000 to 1,500 years, as people brought their religion with them as they migrated, Ia became known as Yahweh, which is Jehovah. And so you've got all these religious practices that started blending. And when the family clan of Israel started picking up those Canaanite religions, they blended their own beliefs in God, their own experiences with God, their own mythologies. Jacob, uh, who was also known as Israel, wrestled with the angel of the Lord at night. And uh, uh, things like that. So those mythologies became part of it. Um, so as people travel, they brought their religions with them. Uh, their myths, their rituals were similar to their own. Um, the similarities aided exchanges between these different cultures that were starting to blend. And in the end, the religions of this entire region all share a striking family likeness, quote unquote. There were a number of popular deities who so closely resembled each other that they were occasionally confused such as Attis, Adonis, Melchart, Tammuz, Marduk, Osiris, Dionysus, Mithras. Do you know, that, by the way, December 25th is the birthday of Mithras. We appropriated that in the Orthodox Church. So the religions which grew up around these various deities were often called the mystery religions. And we talked about that a while back on this show. The mysteries of Dionysus. I refer to it as the Dionysus, the Osiris Dionysus collective of God men that were Messiah type characters prior to the time of Christ. The mysteries of Attis, and so on. So it might be really interesting for you to note when talking about the Apostle Paul, Tarsus, the birthplace of Paul, Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle is believed to have originated. The mystery schools were well established. That's uh, all of these mystery religions. Some, well, some of them in that region came from Tarsus. It's where Paul grew up. Became a Jew. Became a Jew's Jew. 
So uh, um, the syncre the, the synch syncretistic tradition that mingles, confuses, or combines all these deities, whose appearance or function seem more or less similar, had been clearly present in Tarsus long before Paul was alive. And Tarsus boasted a university of Stoic philosophers, and a person could attend their public lectures without being enrolled as a student. Um, this influence may explain why the Pauline epistles in the New Testament, all these letters he wrote that comprise a good half of our New Testament, set out some of the fundamentals of Stoic philosophy. Believe it or not. If you dig through, you'll find that in there. All of the, like, like Paul said, I wish you would, uh, all were as I am, unmarried. So I could go forward and carry the work of it. That's a stoic philosophy, whether you realize it or not. All of the mystery religions were similar in theme. Many of the deities died at a certain time of year to be restored to life later, either in connection with solar or agri agricultural cycles. Their mysteries, in other words, were tied to the seasons and in the stories of death and rebirth, visible expression to the great mystery of the human destiny. Every one of those religions offered their followers the hope of immortality and promised the means to attain it. And for several thousand years, Egyptians also had a strong belief in eternal life and in the immortality of the soul. Concerning this belief, historian James Bonwick takes an example from the Book of the Dead, Egyptian Book of the Dead, which says, Thy soul rests among the gods. Respect for thy immortality dwells in their hearts. In the mystery religions, as the god suffers and dies, so too does humanity. But the god's restoration, his resurrection, is a sign of his triumph over the suffering and the death. Um, there's a song I remember that was actually banned, outlawed, this group was, when I was in the youth group growing up in the very fundamentalist conservative Baptist church. And uh, it was from a group called Petra. And uh, they were kind of the mimicking the uh, big fuzzy-haired acid rock bands of the day in the 1970s and the 80s. But they had this great song called Grave Robber. And it said, there is a place we must all stand alone, an appointment we have with the great unknown. Like a vapor, this life is just waiting to pass, like the flowers that bloom, like the withering grass. But life seems so long and death so complete, and the grave an impossible portion to cheat. But there's one who has been there and still lives to tell. There is one who has been through both heaven and hell. And the grave will come up empty-handed that day. Jesus will come and steal us away. And it goes into the chorus. Where is the sting? Tell me, where is the bite? When the grave robber comes like a thief in the night. And it goes on. So this is, this is that belief that there was... Uh, an an immortal, immortality that was promised and attainable, but because the God also had to go through that. Jesus the God, the Son of God, God very God, I and the Father are one, he said. So to be connected to this immortality, the believer would go through a series of rituals or initiations. Often one goes through uh, which the God himself had passed. These outward observances would assure an inner assimilation with God, or the God, or the God-man, which guaranteed that the believer, the follower's future, would be like the God's, eternal. And in case we doubt the truth of this, Firmicus Maternus, a Christian writer of the 4th century A.D., describes the assurances given to the mystery, um, the mystery initiates, in which the priest anoints the throat of each person with holy oil and says, Take confidence from the fact that God is saved, and you shall be, you also, saved at the end of your trials. Speaking, of course, of the resurrection, and uh, or relating to, uh, in Christianity, the resurrection. The rituals of the mysteries are much more than mere trials 
uh, I'm sorry, writes uh, that human destiny uh, and of salvation. Let me start my sentence over. The mysteries, these mystery religions were much more than just rites of passage or rites of spirituality. Uh, the issue here concerned a certain idea of human destiny and of salvation, of trustful confidence in a divine God, a divine Lord, who has consented to live and suffer like a man, so that man may be sufficient may sufficiently resemble him to be able to effect a union with him and be saved by casting his lot with him forever, as it were. So this is what we're doing. And the Bible says, emulate Jesus, emulate Christ, that we must be Christ-like uh, in order to gain what Christ has. And that it's not of our works, but it's a free gift of his because he was killed and went to hell and came up and resurrected on the third day, that this is what we can attain as well for our eternal salvation. We can be just like him. We can be his follower. So, um, saved by becoming like him, by following him, by observing what he did, sometimes just ritualistic in the mystery religions. So this description should sound familiar to us today. It remains the primary source of most religious sentiment that Jesus came as the Son of God, the equal to God, died for our sins and was raised again to give us new life, and we can have that for the asking. All we have to do is follow Him and uh, uh, identify with Him. And so this spiritual relationship and the identification with the divine is exactly what the Apostle Paul's doctrine concerning the mission and role of Jesus was. Not even the weighty moral element implied in Paul's teaching. And by that I mean the injunction to live a life not purely or merely pious, but pure, charitable, lofty. Um, that's peculiar to him for the mysteries too. And uh, uh, this is what Paul said we were to be. Peculiar followers. Remember that peculiar came up before. God called his people to choose to be a peculiar people. And the same is asked of followers of Christ. They made demands of the same nature upon their initiates in Christianity. Now, out of this environment then, which was already being organized into syncret syncretistic, I don't know why I keep uh, flubbing up that word, the syncretistic combinations, Christianity arose out of all of that. And it was surrounded by mystery religions whose purpose was to align believers with the immortality of the gods. And as the god overcame death and enjoyed eternal life, so would the follower, the believer. And these mystery religions also freely borrowed concepts from each other and lent themselves indefinitely to all kinds of exploitation. For the future of Christianity, therefore, it constituted almost an inexhaustible reserve of material that all was blended in and evolved into what we have now in modern Christianity to a certain extent. And so there's this, what I call the inexhaustible reserve. This is that non-historical body of research that examines the content of ancient religions in order to explore their impact on the development of Christianity. And most of the researchers in this area have come to the conclusion that the Christian mythos is directly borrowed from its pagan neighbors. It's not based in historical events. While Jesus himself may be a historical person, and his teachings were historical, what we believed about the divinity and, the, and the, 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 the immortality of the follower by identifying with the God is all borrowed from the mystery religions of the Mesopotamian region uh, and Egyptian and all the surrounding regions around first century Judea where it began. <coughs> These historical tie-ins um, are more than exception to the rule in Christianity. Occasionally, a historical Christianity uh, figures, uh, historical figures appear 
in Christianity and in the story, but these historical tie-ins are an exception. Like Pontius Pilate. It was believed for hundreds of years that Pilate was part of the Jesus myth, that he wasn't actually a real person because there wasn't much data on him in the historical record of Rome. He's a Roman governor of a dust-water armpit end of the, the empire type of, uh, of region, Judea. And they thought he didn't exist. And I brought this up before. It wasn't until uh, 1964 when an archaeological team in Caesarea Philippi, which was the Roman capital of Judea, they were conducting uh, a, a, an excavation on something totally different. And in a stairway, they found blocks from an old building that had been reused, recycled, to build this old stairway that was over 1,500 years old. And one of the blocks in the stairway was actually an old cornerstone, and it had an inscription on that cornerstone, which gave the name of Pilate. Pontius Pilatus Praefectus Idue, uh, Prefect of Judea. He is dedicating a gymnasium to Tiberius Caesar. And that cornerstone, of course, now stands in the Jerusalem Museum. Now, that was 1964. That was the first bit of historical archaeological evidence that said that Pontius Pilate existed at all as the governor of Judea at the time of Jesus. And then, of course, all the other little bits and pieces they had started to fall into place once they found the hard evidence. So, occasionally, you'd have real historical characters come into the Jesus story. Now, according to scholars, Jesus, and that's pretty general, there are scholars, I'm not going to name them all, but Jesus did not exist as a historical person. Now, I disagree with them because I believe he existed as a historical person. Nor did John the Baptist exist, or Mary and Joseph, or the disciples the virgin birth, Jesus' ministry, his death, the resurrection weren't even historical events, they tell us. And the, the position of these scholars is that all of these historical events were things that were infused into Christianity, borrowed from religions already in existence, or created afresh from ideas already made popular in these other religions in order to make Christianity seem like a working religion and something that they could start and build and draw people into. So, the scholars point out that most religions are based on a, on a story of a divine or a heroic character uh, who goes into a lower world either literally by incarnating into a body or experiences victories over enemies, performs miraculous deeds, suffers, dies, rises, returns to his native upper world, in the heavens, if you will, and then celebrates his triumph by being enthroned on high, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and in the Bible we're told. And while the pagan stories were treated as symbolic, the Christian story quickly lost its symbolic character by treating its mythos as historical fact and making Jesus into an historical figure that experienced all of these things. In the process of how this happened uh, is the primary focus of what I want to talk about, and I'm finally getting to it. We've got about a minute left of the show. So, isn't this a preposterous claim for these scholars to make? in Christianity, and spe especially in light of uh, the centuries of teaching by the church, the seamless history that Christian scripture portrays, what kind of people would make such outrageous claims? A review of scholars reveals a wide range of people, from ardent free thinkers to humanists, to those who are neutral about religion, to those who are fervent Christians, those who are strongly Christian uh, definitely struggle with the evidence and the conclusions. But they brush that off as something that, well, God had his way. You know, uh, it's hard to understand the mysteries of God, how God works. God in Isaiah 55, how much higher are my ways than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain comes down from heaven and waters the, the earth and returns to heaven, 
That is how much higher my ways are than your ways. It's things you don't understand how it works. You can understand the mechanics. You don't understand the why of it. That's what God told us, and that's what we're supposed to believe. So those who are strongly Christian definitely struggle with the evidence and the conclusions of this. But they seem to prefer the struggle over being at ease in their, in their faith while ignorant of the evidence. Do you want to believe something in your heart that you can't prove is so, and you have to defy the evidence to believe it, believing that God is stronger than the evidence? Would you rather live that way or live knowing something? I want to know things. I don't know about you. But some even stated that their belief that Christianity would be stronger and more persuasive if it could acknowledge its origins and the symbolic nature of its mythos. And while this material could be presented in a number of ways, such as uh, by culture, Babylonian, Greek, etc., by deity, Attis, Mithras, so on, we've decided to treat it in Christianity by topic. And we're going to go start covering how this relates to the story of Jesus. But we can't do that tonight because we're out of time. End of the show, folks. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Thanks for wearing your thinking caps and your steel panties. So we'll talk to you next time. I'm going out for a 23-hour break, and we'll be back. Sit tight.